Welcome back everyone. This is Crowned with Glory Reborn and this is part two of my message on why do I care so much for someone who gives so little. And if you missed part one, I will have the link for it at the very end of this video that you can just click on and go to it. In that video, we talked about intensity versus intimacy, which is something that a lot of people get confused with. Sometimes we can over-spiritualize these things and say, oh, this is my twin flame, <laughs> you know? And yeah, there might be a lot of chemistry with this person, but like I said before, be very careful because a lot of times people who are personality disordered, toxic, dysfunctional, they have a lot of intensity of emotions. And intensity should not be confused with depth of emotions. Um, sometimes people who have an intensity of emotions, they just experience a lot of one thing, okay, but not a full range. Um, they might feel, you know, if they're, they might have a fear of, of being shamed by people publicly, but they don't feel guilty if they hurt your feelings, okay? So it's selective, right? And what we're going for is to see this full range of emotions and keeping kind of a moderate rather, rather than all this drama going on, which is common among, like I said, dysfunctional, toxic people. Unfortunately, this is the difficult part. A lot of people prefer intensity over intimacy. And it can make us feel like, wow, there's chemistry going on and there's something super spiritual in the connection. But in reality, you're dealing with somebody who's got a personality disorder. So be aware of that. And like I said before in the last video, I talk about it in my book, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse um, and Emotionally Unavailable People. I talk about that in the book that you really want to take your time with people because if you're dealing with somebody who's emotionally unavailable, narcissistic, this is somebody who is going to fake compatibility. They can fake shared values. And if that's the case, the mask that they're wearing will usually come off within six months. And during this time, that's really a testing ground, a proving ground of whether or not this person is capable of, of building intimacy because intimacy is something that doesn't develop in hours, days, weeks. It's something that develops in months, years. So go slow with people. And again, I don't mean to minimize any of you who have felt like um, you had a strong chemistry with somebody. I've been there, done that. I understand. And you might have, okay. You really might have, but, um, at the same time, look beyond the surface of that. Ask yourself, this person that I have this chemistry with, um, are they able to give me intimacy or is this just about intensity? Um, and, and if they can't give intimacy, I'm sorry, it's not going to go the distance. And this person is going to bring a lot of, lot of drama in your life. Now, for this um, episode, I, I want to pick up where we left off in part one uh, about trauma bonding versus healthy emotional bonding and how the codependents are forever trying to work through all this intensity in their relationships, working harder and harder to build intimacy with somebody who's bringing a lot of intensity and maybe doesn't have the tools in the shed or isn't open emotionally to build that intimacy and you're trying, 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 but this person just doesn't, they can't or won't go the distance to build intimacy. And as I mentioned in part two, we've got to ask ourselves, why are you staying in this dynamic? Some of you might believe this is love, but is it really? Okay, if we go back to Teal Swan's definition of love, which is taking another person's best interest as your own. If this person is not taking your best interest as their own, is this love? And if it's not, then love is not keeping you there. What is? And I would venture to say it's relationship addiction, unfortunately. And here's the trouble. 
that with the codependence and empaths, when you keep going back, working through this intensity, trying desperately harder and harder to build intimacy with this person uh, who is unwilling or unable, every time you go back and do this, you are strengthening a trauma bond with them. You are reinforcing relationship addiction. Because there's a lot of hyper arousal in this relationship. There's seduction mixed with fear. Because you have had uncertainty with this relationship. This is an unpredictable person. You don't know if you're coming or going with them. You don't know what you're ever going to get out of them. I mean, like, I have been involved with somebody like this. Like, <laughs> I never knew what they were going to do. And to this day, same person. I, you, I don't know what I'm going to get out of them until I get it. Because they can say they're sorry and the next day it's something else. Or they, you know, they change this month and the next month it's a repeat. There's no consistency with this person. There's no certainty, no predictability. And it's very, by the way, disruptive to your sense of stability, your internal. You can't settle down with this person. Your entire nervous system is constantly kept in this limbo where you can't settle down. It's hyper arousal, okay? And all of these strong emotions are very confusing. You could have also getting confused about the emotions. For example, if you're dealing with somebody who's jealous, you might mistake this as, um, oh, this person really cares about me. Or, oh, you know, because of the way they were treated and you rationalize it, oh, just give it some time and he'll learn to trust or she'll learn to trust, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but they're insecure and that's not something that you or they can fix. Maybe, again, their way of uh, coping and self-soothing with this unhealed insecurity that they have no intention of healing is just to keep you constantly on pins and needles uh, reassuring them and proving yourself to them so they can feel safe in the relationship, you know, that kind of thing. And this is very abusive, right? This is a, a relationship where the feelings are very unpredictable. You might be dealing with attachment styles that are highly um, avoidant, um, right? This independent, I don't need anyone, I don't need you, you know, trying to prove to themselves and everybody else that they don't need a relationship, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Um, or, you know, very anxious, which is the opposite end of the spectrum where there's just um, fear of, oh my God, if I say that, I'll, I'll lose them or they'll leave or whatever. So you're constantly trying to accommodate this person and console this person, even if it means that you're killing yourself inside. There's just a higher degree of uncertainty with these relationships. And eventually you get addicted to this high arousal okay and if and, and if you get around somebody who's normal and healthy they comparatively seem very boring and uninteresting to you and you're like why do I keep getting attracted to these toxic crazy people you know um, well that might be why because you've, you've gotten addicted to these relationships and you see them through a, a cloudy lens of oh we have a connection here um, and you rationalize it maybe in some way as love, as a twin flame, soulmate, whatever you want to call it, to spiritualize something very damaging and dysfunctional and to justify you staying in this. And you have learned probably from your childhood to confuse in more intensity with more love. Like the more intense this person is, the more I feel like they're really into me. They're really invested in me. Some of you, again, if you're empaths, codependents, you learned to hyper attune to people who are not attuning to you, right? You learned to tune into their feelings, their emotions, their thoughts. And confuse this hyper attunement with connection. And again, if you're an empath, you might be tuning into something very real in the ethers. Okay, I've experienced this as well, but I had to learn in my own self healing journey that sometimes there is, yes, a real empathic connection there. But that's because of me. 
that's because I'm picking up. That's because I'm hyper attuned to this person. It's not because they're tuning into me because they're not. I can guarantee you they're not. This person that I'm thinking of, by the way, in my example, is so not paying attention to their intuition. They're so checked out of using intuition and empathy. They are detached, detached. That's their motto, you know, last I checked. Uh, their motto is detachment and um, intuition is just stupid, stupid talk for stupid people, right? It's a joke. And um, matter of fact, I'm doing this channel because that person made fun of me and my intuitive abilities and told me you should take that show on the road, which I did. Thank you, almost 30,000 subscribers later. <laughs> but anyway, I'm back to the thing at hand that I'm trying to tell you is that, um, yeah, there's a connection from your end of it because you're hyper attuning to them, but it doesn't mean that they're hyper attuning to you. you you've got to be aware, like, get clear on this, okay? You might love them. You're taking their best interests as your own, but are they doing the same for you? Are they taking your best interests as their own? And if they're not, they're not loving you, not in a real way, okay? This is getting beyond the feelings of love into the action, action of love. Now, with healthy relationships, there are rules that are mutually respected, feelings of safety and vulnerability, and there is there is fighting, like I said before, it's fair fighting. I talked about that in my video on healing. Uh, how do I get a healing relationship, okay? What is a healing relationship? How do I get one? I talk about it there where it's fighting fair, all right? And there's discussions. There's not secrets. There's, you know, nobody's getting anybody to cover up for them their shady behavior. And there's conflict resolution. Um, there's negotiation. Everybody, each party is acknowledging the other person's position in this relationship. But unfortunately, if you're in a relationship where there's addiction, what's happening is a lot of deprivation and suffering followed by some kind of relief. And this is a repeat pattern where you know, they give you what you want, they drop you a crumb, and then they starve you out for a while. And it's almost like you're a dog waiting at their table for the next crumb to drop. And why do you stay there at their table waiting for the crumb to drop? This is called intermittent reinforcement, by the way. I talk about it in my book, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse. You stay at the table because you have been trained by this person who is breadcrumbing you that, hey, if I just string you along and I drop you a crumb every so often, you'll keep coming around, right? It's like feeding a stray animal. I mean, maybe I don't feed them every night. Maybe I don't take them into my home, but they know if they keep coming around my door, eventually I'm going to put something out there, some scraps. And this is the problem. You have been trained through this reinforcement that, you know, eventually they're going to drop you a crumb and you get occasional reward for your effort, your sacrifice. And this reinforces your false faith in continuing to work on this relationship, right? Because if they completely cut you off cold and starved you out, then you wouldn't keep doing this now, would you? And so what happens over time with this, you know, intermittent reinforcement, um, you start identifying them and you, with them and you start rationalizing uh, their behavior out of helplessness. I mean, what other power do you have in the dynamic? Oh, well, I mean, he really means well, but that's all he can give right now. And, you know, he'll do better when he can and he never seems to do better, you know, that kind of thing or she, I don't want to make it about gender here, but I am a woman and I've had a lot of these dynamics with the opposite sex, mm, some with the same sex, right? Um, it can go either way, however it applies to you, but I don't want to, let me be clear that I'm not trying to alienate anybody, okay? Um, especially the men on my channel, I really appreciate my male viewers because, um, 
there's not a lot of men who watch this type of stuff. Um, you know, usually the kind of viewers who are into this this type of content are females, all right? But again, don't mean to alienate the men. I very much value my male viewers. Back to the topic at hand, this intensity that we get accustomed to, it becomes a replacement for intimacy. Um, because they're not going to give you anything more, and you'd rather that than nothing at all. You'll take what you can get. They're scraps. And this might be coming from childhood programming, past trauma bonds that have kind of wired your brain to normalize these kind of exchanges with people where you get betrayed or you feel shamed in some way or you feel afraid like you have to hide aspects of yourself your true self or you have to hide what you want or need you can't openly really put it out there or fight for or stand up for what you want or need because dear god i mean if you do that then they might just totally abandon or reject you you know and put you out in the cold which by the way i mean it's a very real fear that i talk about in my book about when you start laying down boundaries with people who have been violating them every which way to Sunday, okay? When you start laying down boundaries, these people retaliate and they're not going to follow. And like I say in my book, it's not a cure-all. It's just because you put, just because you start setting and maintaining healthy boundaries doesn't guarantee that these people are going to cooperate. As a matter of fact, they probably won't. They're going to buck your system. And I tell people in the book, get ready for it. But the, the purpose of boundary setting is not to get people to do what you want. It's, it's really to stand up for yourself so that you can get these people out of your life who will not meet your needs, cannot or will not meet your needs. And then you can make space for these healthy relationships where people can and will because you've already come out with it. Hey, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. This is what I need. And this person's in agreement with you without you having to like wrangle them into it or talk them into it, you know, or convert them, you know. So if you've come from a background where you've been trained that you're not going to get your needs met by other people, nobody cares, and that you have to kind of accommodate people and morph yourself around, um, hide, you know, who you are, that like there's something wrong with you or what you want or need, you know, to be ashamed of, of standing up for yourself, like you're a bad person, you know, if you don't just accommodate other people to your own expense, you know, if you have been brought up like this, then there's going to be a lot of withholding in your relationships where people are not sharing openly. Um, you're not defending yourself. You're in dynamics where you feel like you have to prove your, your self-worth, your value, that you're worthy of them investing in the relationship, working on the relationship. And these are very hurtful exchanges. I mean, honestly, like, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to chase you know, I might talk for a while, but I'm sorry, I have a cutoff point. I've learned, like, if you have to be convinced or converted into my way of seeing things, this is, we're off on the wrong foot. If I have to ch chase after you to get you to, like, engage in a relationship or work on the relationship, um, this is not going to work. And I have, with my healing work, gotten, you know, um to a place where I'm stronger and be able to walk away from the people who frankly are willing to walk away from me. Their actions, their words and actions, or the incongruency of their words and actions are telling me that they're willing to walk away from me. So I've gotten stronger where I can walk away from these people, which is the appropriate action. It's the appropriate response. Now some symptoms that you are in relationship addiction would be that you invest in people or relationships who are not investing in you or the relationship. They're just not making an investment. And maybe even obsessing about people who have hurt you even though they're long gone. Maybe you still wonder or you fantasize or you... And it might happen because you don't even want it to. Like you're totally done with it. And again, some of you might have a, a, a genuine empathic bond with this person, but it, it's almost haunting. Like, I don't want to keep feeling this person because I know that 
they've hurt me and they're not sorry and they'll hurt me again, you know, if I bring them back into my life. There's also another symptom is that you continue to seek contact with people who you know are going to cause you pain. You try to continually reach out to fix this relationship or rekindle it and maybe and go overboard in trying to help people who are destructive. And when you're in these relationships that are unbalanced, anytime there's unequal give and take, it just triggers you to work harder to balance it out, even though they're not showing any signs of wanting to do that. Because you just keep repeatedly trusting people who have repeatedly proven themselves to be untrustworthy and unreliable. You might also have an inability to distance yourself from this and just walk away from the conflict because you have this deep need to be understood, right? You're seeking intimacy. You're trying to build it. There's a lot of intensity here and you're working harder and harder to build the int intimacy because you want to get that close bond with this person. You want to be known and know this person who clearly, demonstratively, does not care. And so you do this by re-explaining, re-defending, and trying to show to them that you are worthy of them doing the work. You're worthy of having them fight for the relationship. You persist in trying to maybe even convince them that there's a problem, even though they clearly don't care. They don't care if there's a problem. And if there is, they don't want to solve it. And they've let you know that repeatedly. And you might have been... You might have remained loyal to people who have betrayed you. Maybe you even, you even kept secrets about them and how they exploited you, abused you, maybe other people as well that you knew about. And then you could even maintain contact. If this is an abuser, you maintain contact with a, an abuser who does not acknowledge the abuse or invalidates your feelings about the abuse. Another symptom is you try to get the approval of people who you know are users. You know it. You try to be nice to these people so that they don't think less of you. You don't want to be the bad person. Here's the problem. They do think less of you when you do that. They lose respect for you because you're not respecting yourself. You're allowing yourself to be treated lesser by others. This is maybe, again, I some of us, we have been trained that this is humility, okay? In my Christian background, trained that this is about being humble. The problem is that when you're doing, dealing with a, somebody who's like a narcissist or a psychopath or a sociopath, they that doesn't soften their spirit. <laughs> You know, extending that olive branch does not soften their spirit. It emboldens them. It, it, it like encourages them and reinforces their sense of pride that, yeah, that's right. I am more important than you. Keep groveling. You know what I'm saying? And your lack of self-respect is not going to win respect from other people. So here's some advice I've had to take myself. Very hard to swallow. I'm sorry. But... You got to accept defeat. You're not going to win with these people. And if you're dealing with a narcissist, that relationship was never set up in the first place for you to win. It was always for them to win at other people's expense. You have to accept this truth and the reality of it. I'm sorry. And you've got to drop the fantasy that one day they're going to have a come to Jesus moment and see the light and the error of their ways and furthermore that they're going to apologize for it and they're going to have meaningful change in their life. You, you need to drop that fantasy. Most people, they believe that they're right. They do. And so once you drop the fantasy and you accept defeat that you're not going to win with this person, okay, they're not going to agree with you, you got to ask yourself, why are you so invested in this relationship and keeping it? What are you getting out of it? What are you getting out of it? 
because it's not intimacy. You're not getting intimacy and you're not getting love out of this. Why are you doing this? Let's move on to how we can build intimacy, not intensity, because I think that's the goal. I think what that's what most empaths are trying to do. That's why we get into these imbalance give and take. We, we think that, oh, if I keep giving, then eventually they're going to give back. And we're dealing with toxic, dysfunctional people who have no intention of ever doing that. They're trying to exploit and leverage other people to their advantage, okay? That doesn't work. And again, the intensity is masking a lack of intimacy. They kind of bait you maybe for a moment with this false idealized image that they do share your feelings and values and, and, and all of that and compatibility. And then later you just find that there's no actual intimacy being built over the long term. It was something fleeting in the moment, some temporary high, you know? And so it is likely that you have, you're going to have to release these people. We have to number one, recognize who we can build intensity with and who we can't. And then we need to respond appropriately by releasing them to their own choices. And this is about rec recognizing and respecting other people's boundaries as unhealthy and unloving as they might be, right? The boundaries of the emotionally unavailable person, the narcissist is, I don't want to open up to you. I don't want to be attached to you. I don't even want a healthy attachment. I want to be detached. I want to be independent. I don't need anybody. I don't need a relationship. Well, okay, then as the empath, you say, you know what? God bless you. Bye-bye now, right? And you don't let them take a rent in your mind anymore. Um, you respect their choices. This is their spiritual journey in life and let them go down the path that they need to go down with where they're at in life right now, okay? If they're telling you in word and deed that they cannot or will not meet your needs, you, you need to believe them and you need to release them with a faith that somebody else will, okay? And that's the problem. That's why a lot of codependents and empaths don't re recognize and release these patterns is because they don't want to accept defeat. And they're afraid that they're not going to find another connection like that. But if you have to convince or convert this person, I'm sorry, major red flag. If you're an empath, you do have the ability to see the potential of a person. This is what makes it really doubly hard for us, is that you can see the potential of who this person can be, of what this relationship can be in its highest expression, okay? But what I've had to learn tough lesson I've had to learn in life is that you've got to also learn to see who people choose to be. Again, it's about recognizing and respecting the feedback that this person is giving you with their words and their actions, as painful as that might be. Who they can be and who they choose to be, oftentimes two different things. And at the end of the day, you got to live with who they choose to be. Also, if you're starting, you know, a relationship with somebody, like I said before, go slow and steady. It might be, feel really boring or awkward, you know, if you're not used to doing this. You're used to these high-intensity relationships where you meet somebody and maybe you're having sex with them, let's say, within the first three weeks that you meet. Um, the problem is that if you have sex without commitment, it is going to, you know, leave you feeling lonely and unsure like where is this person what's happening here again the uncertainty um because you have no intimacy with this person uh and sex without intimacy is really a lot of times performance based even for men men who get in these quickie dynamics with sex it brings a lot of pressure for them to perform um they don't have any heart in it, number one. Um, how can you? you? You've got very little invested. You don't even know this person. Um, but it brings pressure upon them to deliver more that they might not even feel like they can live up to. And especially if this is somebody who's avoiding going deeper um, as the, the relationship continues on, the pressure builds for them to deliver more and more and more. 
that they can't or won't live up to. And so be aware of this. Uh, overly de detached men, women who you know, have sex very quick, but there's no intimacy, or again, there's a lot of intensity confused for intimacy. Um, these are usually often very hurt people, and they have a lot of secrets that they're trying to hide. I heard one person say, the sicker your secrets are, the more difficult it is for you to open up to intimacy. But somebody has very good boundaries is going to be able to discern who is healthy and who isn't in terms of sexual intimacy. Now, if you're in an intense relationship and you are trying to achieve intimacy, you need to understand the toll that this relationship has taken on you. Um, what needs of yours have been ignored within yourself? How have you compromised yourself? And some of you need to get angry about it. It's actually a healthy emotion. You need to get angry about it. You need to take your power back. And you need to grieve the loss of the relationship. Even if you need to cry. I talk about this in my book. Grieve the loss of this relationship not being what you thought or wanted it to be. Or what it was sold as being by this person. Because they were charming you. They were wearing this false idealized image that they could not maintain. The mask eventually came off. You look behind it and you realize this is a very character impaired person. There's something also very important that you need to learn in your healing process, which is how to be supportive of other people, which I know you want to do, but how do you do this in a way where you're not doing the work for them? You're not fixing it for them because it is their job actually to, to identify and communicate what their needs and wants are, just as that is your job for yourself to communicate your own uh, needs and wants and learn how to uh, avoid helping people who regularly betray, harm, exploit you. Just stop getting sucked into their victim narrative. Some of them are covert narcs, you know, but they keep getting themselves into crises that they're creating. So you've got to get clear really on who you are and, and your values, what's negotiable in relationships, what's not. And if you have been so busy your entire life from your upbringing into your adult relationships, catering to everybody else and prioritizing other people, you have not had a chance to really do the self-awareness and healing work so that you can clearly communicate to yourself and another, this is what I want and need. And I talk about that in my book as well, but... Um, this is really going to be necessary. You, you know, you might need to go no contact with these people if they're really dysfunctional. And if, if you're in a breakup, um, take some time. Maybe even, I'm, I know this is going to be seem crazy to some of you. Maybe take a year off and say, you know what? This year, it's, it's about me. It's about me focusing on my needs, my wants, my desires, and getting very clear within myself and becoming a better caregiver to myself because I've, I've already given enough to all these other people who are not giving in return. It's time for me. Once you've done that healing work, you can then, you know, become more vulnerable with others because you know very clearly what you're able to accept and what you're not. You're more open to, you know, trust others. And um, yes, vulnerability, you know, is risky. Okay, it risks rejection, ridicule, shame, abandonment, pain. It also shares and fears and securities about what you think and what you feel. But um, when you have healthy boundaries, you know, okay, this person is safe for me to share with. But like I said, be aware of this quick sex because it's, a, it's not a shortcut to intimacy. Intimacy is going to take months, years to build. And true intimacy is emotional, not necessarily sexual and physical. Yes, I do believe that sex is, um, if we're really having sex in a way that is that spirit intended that there is a mind body spirit connection when we come in sexual union with people but realize that true intimacy can apart can occur apart from sex 
and it can enhance sex and physical intimacy. But I think something also that I've had to learn with intimacy and, and then the communications, and I was just hearing this today with Jordan Peterson talking about a lot of people don't listen when they're, they're, they're conversating with one another. They don't actually listen. They're trying to get the other person to um, hear them or get the other person to see or admit the wrong and to agree with them. But the more vulnerable route that you can take um, to presenting your arguments in relationships, you know, is not going to be through coming up with facts, figures that are supporting your beliefs um, and sharing your motives with them. It's more along the lines of saying something like, I'm trying to get you to see why this isn't right for me because I have this want, need, desire. When you have that conversation, you might come to the realization that the person is like, well, I understand what you're saying, that that's not right for you, but me meeting that need, desire, want is not right for me and that's where you have to part ways with this person and you wish like man I wish we had this conversation you know on our first date when you were trying to like get me in bed <laughs> you know uh, rather than you know six months later or how many years later when I am so madly in love with you and maybe we've got kids involved in the mix and now you're letting me know finally that you're never going to meet this need want or desire but with boundaries, we can prevent all this stuff from happening. We can find out who it is safe to open up to. and But we learn through boundary setting, you know, who we can trust and who we can't. Rather than giving people too much too soon that they didn't earn, they don't deserve, you know, because they're not trustworthy or they're going to violate trust. And so with boundary setting, there's a need to really learn not to trust people and open up to them prematurely. It's about allowing them to build trust and earn trust over time. And you got to look at this. For example, is this person demonstrating empathy and kindness? Are they opening up and sharing personally as much as you are? Or are you the only one doing this, right? Be aware when you're talking to people in these conversations. I mean, are you doing all the talking and then they're listening? Because they might be gathering information on how to manipulate you later or use it against you later on. Be aware of that, of the give and take in vulnerability and sharing and mutual effort. Are you trusting people who have shown you multiple times, multiple ways that they can't be trusting? And you're just hoping that they're auto-magically going to change if you just love them enough, if you just prove yourself enough. Or do you stop trusting people when they show you that they cannot be trusted? That would be the healthy conclusion. Or the healthy response but some people are just gonna blame when their trust gets violated and so there's a need for the codependence and empaths to take responsibility yes my trust was violated because I gave it to somebody who could not be trusted I'm not going to do that again or I knew that person they couldn't be trusted and I didn't respond appropriately I didn't recognize and respond appropriately. I'm taking responsibility. And the cool thing is that when you recognize and respond appropriately to toxic behavior, then you are getting your power back, okay? This is not really about you putting yourself down for bad decisions, okay? It's about taking that painful feedback from life and transforming it into power. It's balance, about balancing self-correction with self-compassion. Like, I'm still learning at this. I wasn't trained in my childhood how to do this. I had to recognize and respond to this appropriately. But I'm learning. And the more I learn, the stronger I'm going to get. This is not going to happen again. I'm not going to allow it. Um, but, well, i got to say, when it's everybody else's fault, then you're just a hopeless, helpless victim. But when you start taking responsibility that I didn't set healthy boundaries, I didn't maintain them, I didn't allow this people to this person to earn trust, you know, then you're just um I think you get what I'm saying. It's it's really um about taking your power back. And I hope that's something that I've been, helped you to do with this video where you're learning uh where you're losing your power and how to get it back. 
And I want to say that I'm sorry for those of you who have gone through definitely feeling love for somebody, an empathic connection, chemistry. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a lot of people who there might be some spiritual spark, okay, but they're not ready, they're not healed, they're unhealed, and unfortunately, unfortunately a lot of people do not want to do the healing work. They don't want to face their own inner demons. They want the easy button. They want to get off onto the next, you know, uh, fleeting romance, you know, the next soulmate, twin flame, okay? They want the next intense relationship. And all you can do is, like I said, recognize and respond to that in a healthy way. Get your power back so that you can get into healthier relationships and you're not left with this feeling of caring so much for someone who's given you so little hope i've helped you it's been a long video but i hope it's blessed you and if you didn't see part one um let's see click over here <laughs> click over here to watch part one okay till next time wishing you all the best be blessed